Welcome to our talk, the place where we agree to disagree, if we disagree at all. My guest today is Ben Haggard from New Mexico. Our topic is interplay. Good morning, Ben. Good morning, Renee. Good for you of you to be here. I hope you've had your morning coffee already. I've had a cup of tea. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, at this point, I just want to introduce you to my viewers uh, for a few minutes. And um, you're invited to correct me afterwards or add to it if I forget something. Um, I simply consulted the uh, Regenesis website and I copied a few things here about Ben. Ben specializes in a holistic systems-based approach to understanding and building upon the complex human, natural, and economic relationships that create and sustain the vitality and viability of a place. Let me take a deep breath. That was a rather complex sentence. Now, Ben provides a range of expertise helping to develop models of thinking that integrate ecological and living system approaches. He has worked with developers <clears throat> and design teams, governmental agencies, sitting planning departments, educational institutions, nonprofit organizations, and others. Presumably, that's where uh, I met you, Ben, um, in the Reiki community. You moderated, or maybe I should say navigated. Uh, for two and a half years, I was in a group, uh, and we met monthly on Zoom, which was led by you. So that would probably be one of the others. Ben is a skilled writer, a facilitator, and strategic thinker. His work focuses on developing processes that merge diverse stakeholders around unifying higher order aims. Okay, now, dear viewer, you've heard things like merge, uh, Coles, I think, was the original verb, but I wasn't sure how to pronounce it, so I substituted it with merge. Relationships, integrate, and maybe that is a hint why we got onto the topic of interplay today. Um, I see you nodding, Ben. Please, say a few words about yourself, about the idea of us talking about interplay. Yeah, the... Um... The work that I do has a lot to do with helping um, communities come together around some larger common purpose. Uh, it's a way of thinking about change and working on change. It's based on actually developing the inherent potential that lies within individuals, organizations, and communities. And um, so that's... Primarily what I work on, I do it in the context or have for many years done it in the context of climate change, of environmental degradation, you know, and how to lift up the way human beings live on our planet, live in the places where they live. But it actually applies to almost any context. That's the yeah, personal focus. Indeed, uh, to me, when I read this, you know, uh, some of it, uh, unifying is not a far throw from uh, reconciling and, and uh, you know, it, it, and, and it's somewhat meaningful to me that uh, there is a, a, para, a, a compatibility um, of our work, um, but uh, I don't necessarily just mean you and me, but so many others. In fact, most of the people <clears throat> I get to talk to on our talks, they would uh, find a commonality in that also. Um, you know, uh, the, the, you had two words here and you used one um, again, and that was Unifying, you just addressed, and higher order. Well, how expand on that? I, I didn't get that quite. Um, I'd like to think that when I talk to you, it's higher order, but um, maybe that's just my ego talking right now. Well, 
<laughs> so I think let me back up just a second and speak to the uh, concept of reconciliation, which in our work is actually a technical term. Uh, and it has to do with bringing um, different perspectives or um, value sets that appear to be in conflict uh, into harmony by shifting to a different level of understanding of the whole that they are a part of. That's literally what reconciliation means. So you have to shift off of the, the plane on which the dynamic is playing out as conflict to a different plane where it is seen as whole and these are different aspects of a whole. And that's what we mean by higher order. You're shifting to a different order of system or different order of understanding, different order of energy that allows things even fierce or ancient conflicts to be held as somehow whole. Yeah, so uh, another operative word would be holistic uh, in also in the biography I read to you because uh, holistic stems from whole, from all of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, how did we get to choose interplay? I know we were um, I, we spoke a week ago or so with each other and uh, we reconnected after more than a an year. And I know you've been land bound for a year. This must be very unusual for you because you're a globetrotter. And uh, when I showed your name, I had New Mexico slash Berlin where you live a great part of your uh, life or of a normal year. Um, so you're land bound and um, uh, that's a, a very sec um, secluded or uh, it's not a you're not much in interplay with the rest of the world uh, the world how how did we get to choose interplay as our topic can you what i remember um is <laughs> that you were curious about the way my training as an artist influenced the way that i've ended up working in the world and uh, I think that's where the word came up, that there's this interplay between um, uh, understanding the world through an artist's eyes. I was trained as a painter uh, and uh, understanding the world as um, an, understanding the world as a play of energies that we can actually work on and work with through the development of our conscious understanding. And uh, so that's what I came away from that conversation with, that I've never really been invited to talk about that. They seem to be radically different worlds. On one level, I'm a kind of educator activist. And on the other level, I'm a kind of hermit painter. <laughs> In fact, uh, one of the notes I made in preparation for our conversation was to challenge you, why does it need to say anywhere that you are actually a painter, an artist? And this is um, very much, and quite frankly, when I had the privilege of being in that group I mentioned earlier on, um, how you dealt with so many um, characters, personalities. We were a group of up to 45 people at the time. Uh, and this was pre-corona when nobody or not many people uh, Zoomed or, or did online conferences. And, um, you know, conducting like a conductor in an orchestra or um, uh, painting like uh, a, a painter would with a, with a palette of colors uh, was not far off how I perceived you. And uh, you gave me a good keyword. You brought up the painter uh, because I did prepare, uh, prepare a little video I'd like to show with, um, you know what's coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I do. <laughs> Thank you. 
I, when I did my research, uh, I was very happy to stumble across that. And dear viewers, uh, you can, it will be on the description, the, the link, because it's, uh, you saw the finishing of this painting and it was a blank. How long did it take you to, to, to make that portrait? You know, probably 40 minutes, approximately. That's typical for a, a painting of that size. I, I work very fast and in a kind of altered, um, yeah, an altered state while I'm working. Uh, which connects to everything that we're talking about, what it means to tap into a different order of um, energy or understanding. Um, that, that particular event was a, a very unusual. I had been invited, I had, was doing a show at the Contemporary Art Center here in Santa Fe, named Site Santa Fe. And um, uh, they wanted to do an outreach program with kids. Uh, and so uh, they asked if I'd come in over a period of several days and work with different groups of school children and their teachers around painting and portraiture. And so the room, you could tell it was very busy and people were wandering around and it was full of these kids, all of whom were, um, uh, they were all charged with painting their own paintings. And so we had the, the show that I had up on the wall. And then I had these canvases and the teachers would come up and uh, sit for the portrait. And I always do a small portrait as a sketch to get kind of to understand what I'm seeing. And these kids would sit very close to me while I was doing the sketch portrait of their teacher. And I would tell them to sort of see if they could see what I was seeing. And um, I expected it to be chaos. And these kids would come in and I would begin working and they were, you could have heard a pin drop. They were so absorbed in what was going on, so fascinated by it. And um, then afterwards we talk a little bit about you know color and light and not trying to paint things but paint the way the visual phenomena are interacting and then they all went off and they did their own paintings while i painted that big one so that's why it's so chaotic at that point is there are all these people sitting at tables painting paintings of each other while i'm painting and the idea was to create a, an in-studio experience where we're all artists together. It didn't matter our level of expertise or anything, that we were just doing this thing together. It was the most, one of the most magical experiences I've ever had. Um, again, a little bit daunting for a hermit, but you know, in terms of the effect it had on these kids, it was just mind blowing. Well, you know, I'm intrigued. Uh, I'm a great admirer of artists. Uh, in my house upstairs for many years, there was actually a world famous conductor living, an English gentleman, and I often spoke to him. And he said something interesting, incidentally, when he was talking about that state you were referring to when you're drawing. Uh, he says, uh, music is great when, when the orchestra collectively gets into that state. Um, and, and time and space sort of uh, vanishes. And he says in that state, he actually sees music he, in, in colors, like you would probably, as, as, a, as a visual person, you would probably see. Um, so I'm, I'm often amazed when I speak to or listen to artists, how often they seem to not get it, how important they are for society. Um, you know, music is a, such an important place of a regeneration, of uh, self-reflection, and so is any other art, and, and for provocation, and stimulating, and what have you. Um, and in fact, at the back of your uh, apartment, and that's why I kept the picture like that, I can see a self-portrait of yours. And uh, if I may show you uh, my office, um, these are two paintings of my wife. She painted it. So they're portraits of um, an ancient friend and her lover, the fisherman, Greek. 
Um, there's a portrait of my son here in the corner. And down here, there's a portrait, you can hardly see it, of my mother. And on the opposite wall, there is supposedly a portrait of me, uh, uh, but it was painted a uh, hundred years ago. And my wife uh, convinced the Korean Museum. But what I'm trying uh, to give it to her, um, I, what I'm trying to say is in portraits, you're capturing and the portraits we, we saw, and probably the fascination of those kids when you portrayed um, the teacher was that you're capturing so much of a personality, which is much more than, than just uh, paint on canvas. Um, and that is, is such a, a gift for viewers who do not know the person on your canvas. And I think that um, that interplay between the artist and his his subject he paints and then the, the observer who watches the art that triangular that interplay is uh, very very if it's good art presumably uh, it is very um, enriching and it plays a very important process in the healing of society I feel yeah for me uh well, it becomes a very big subject very quickly, but... Um, we have time. <laughs> well, let me begin with a thought that comes from back when I was still an art student. Uh, this is a quote from Thomas Aquinas, which is that art imitates nature in her manner of operations, meaning art is not about the imitation of nature. It's about um, engaging in that process by which nature manifests a universe. And, um, and so in more modern terms, the way we talk about it sometimes is uh, rendering life, meaning I have, to, um, I have to engage with the um, actual experience of being alive in the presence of whatever I'm looking at and have that aliveness be somehow transferred to the image. And um, this means, one of the critical things that this means is that for me personally, or in terms of the way I work, it's critical that I not try to imitate anything, that, I not try, that I'm not trying to describe a thing, a person or a nose or, you know, uh, uh, eyeglasses or, you know, if I'm looking at a landscape, a tree or a mountain or whatever it is, that I have to actually simply see the visual field. I have to experience it as it's coming into me before I've named it, before <laughs> I've turned it into thingness, um, before I've separated it into these abstract concepts. I have to just have an experience of the visual field. And this is what I mean about set it, uh, putting myself into a slightly altered state where I'm trying, to, I'm trying to stay at that moment before I've named anything, before my intellectual mind has engaged and, um, and just hang out there for enough time to get the image onto the canvas. And uh, it's it's very challenging, but it's very it's very enlivening. Well, I think it's more challenging even for a mind like yours. You're um, uh, you're a bright intellectual person who must have already, as a child, found that uh, the intellect is a wonderful. Uh, experience a wonderful tool and in fact um, I did leave a number of sessions uh, which were led by you uh, for two hours two and a half hours as I mentioned earlier uh, sometimes a little bit frustrated because uh, thinking around new ways of modulating our mental our thinking process and the catchword was and is regenerative thinking uh, 
I often found it is uh, very m heavily on the mind. It is very theoretical. And um, here as an artist, you're, you're pinpointing actually a sphere, a practical, literally a hands-on sphere, uh, which is almost like the antidote to this uh, purely intellectual uh, work. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, very much. And uh, it's very... Um... It's almost a, a ubiquitous or universal experience people have when they first encounter regenerative work and regenerative thinking uh, or living systems thinking um, that it appears to be highly intellectual, um, but actually it's an interplay uh, between, to simplify the left and right brain, or we often talk about it between the body mind, the whole of the, you know, the whole of what makes us who we are. And Holistic, the intellectual yeah. mind, right? That, that it's that interplay is where all of the work is happening, that one has to have an embodied experience of something, um, but bring enough rigor and um, discernment to it to be able to build on that experience. And so I'm, I'm that way with my painting in that uh, I'm engaged in this altered state, if you will, uh, but then I have to understand what I did and then go back into it and then understand. And this is how I grow as a painter, you know, through a lifetime. Um, one of the reasons I don't promote my work or really put it out there in the world so much is for me, it's more like, um, it's like a laboratory or a, a inquiry. Um, that I'll often paint the same motif over and over and over and over and over again. It's a form of visual thinking, visual and embodied thinking, um, but it's not intellectual thinking. I, I, I get you. Yeah. Um, and one of the things you're doing over and over again is self-portraits, I believe, because um, uh, one of the first uh, paintings which struck me by you was, as I realized later on, a self-portrait. And I realized it later on because of the, the blue eyes uh, <laughs> in particular. Um, but, uh, you know, the... so. It's all right to, well, the other thing which, which sometimes frustrated me was um, when you work with people, you give them a language, you give them uh, uh, even models with which to work. And um, they're very useful. And, and we need a language to communicate and we need a narrative we can share. That's what we're doing right now. Um, uh, that's fair enough, but sometimes I came out and I thought, but all this is already been there all along. Um, it, it sometimes I felt like, but that's natural. I knew that as a child already, and here you are uh, as a teacher, as a grown up, and you're working with bright, loving, wonderful, um, grown up people. And sometimes, and I always had to catch myself and do an ego check. Is it now my ego who is having arrogant feelings? Or, or am I simply recalling something which has been there all along? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the way that we talk about uh, the, these frameworks that you're, is what you're referring to. They're, they're not exactly models. They're more ways of understanding the underlying structure of, um, of the evolution of understanding or the evolution of thought. And, um, so I alluded to one earlier with regard to reconciliation that we depict that as three arrows two arrows crashing into each other. That's the conflict that's happening at a certain level. And another the arrow going up, which um, describes the move to a different order that allows me to discover a reconciling um, image, right? Or a reconciling insight. And um, so this is a completely natural phenomenon. In, in fact, it's so natural that we would 
maybe say that it's universal, it's ubiquitous, yeah. everywhere in nature. It is the underlying impulse that allows creativity to happen. It's, it's what allows us to, I mean, most people who have creative insights um, go through a period of cognitive dissonance in order to arrive at that insight. Einstein famously spent years, you know, with a cognitive dissonance that eventually yielded his insight into relativity. Um, and so in a way, the larger the dissonance that you can hold for mm -hmm. a, the longer the period, the greater the likelihood of a really breakthrough reconciling idea. Yeah. So uh, in and this basic dynamic is also understood ubiquitously, you know, that it's it's there in cultures everywhere in the world. I introduced this in a um, setting in New Zealand where I was working with a mix of kind of people from Western descent and Maori people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm introducing this framework and uh, the Maori people are saying, oh yeah, yeah, we have that. And they showed this double spiral, which is a universal symbol in their culture. You see it everywhere. It's a double spiral. And they said, that's the, you've got the spiral coming in and the spiral going out, but the space in between is where all the creative realization happens. So they just depicted it in a very different way, but they, it's a very culturally alive and active understanding um, about how you move through apparent conflict, dilemma, or dissonance. Right? It goes right to the heart of what you're working on with this program, right? Yes, correct. Um, I find it as a, as a teacher sometimes paradoxical uh, when people say, oh, it's so hard, it's so difficult because the dissonance or the pain or the, the disease, the illness, uh, has has been so so dominant for such a long time, uh, and the paradox thing is um, very often they're actually just a, literally a breath away from the breakthrough, from the healing. So when you spoke and described this, I I I was teleported into one of the classes where this is always an issue that uh, and and that has maybe also with view to the current situation with covid it has some uh, there is consolation uh in in this thought that sometimes the the, the moment of the greatest pain is the moment we are the closest to enlightenment to healing right the dark night of the soul <laughs> yes yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's an ancient, you know, um, spiritual premise or teaching. Uh, so the, the use of a um, framework like the law of three, the one that I've just been describing, uh, is that it allows us to be uh, explicit and articulate about that. I, it, as you said, it gives us a language. And so we can say, ah, we seem to be in a situation where we've got these opposing forces. How do we begin to look for a third force? How do we introduce that into our conversation, into our awareness, and into our inquiry, the thing that we're seeking? Um, and that's really all its purpose is. Uh, and uh, that's a relatively simple framework. It's immediately accessible to people because it's part of, you know, lived human experience. Um, there are obviously more complex and sophisticated frameworks, but all of them derive in the same way from lived experience. They just are kind of more conceptually demanding. To, it's, it's like as you add terms to a framework, it's like adding dimensions, right? You're now dealing in a kind of multi-dimensional space. And that's just harder to do, but it's totally learnable. We're coming gradually to a, an end of our conversation, and uh, I would love to go on. One of the things which I took uh, as a meaningful observation for me out of this conversation is this interplay between, uh, let me call it a theory or intellectual reflection, and then hands-on, lived 
uh, practice um, that both have have of course an important uh, they they want uh, two sides of the same coin, coin really. Um, so uh, I've made so many notes and I, I didn't get around to any of them and that's fine. I just would like to pick up uh, one, Ben. Uh, that's a quote from our conversation a week ago um, because I admired, it wasn't, I didn't ask you what was your vision in life or how do you define your mission or something, but I picked up on a sentence which I would like to share with my viewers, which impressed me. And um, if you could... Uh, maybe say a few words about this. You're here for consciousness to help, to foster, to nurture consciousness, to help humanity to evolve. Um, that's how I summed up our conversation. And if my wife had asked me to um, say in one, two, three, four, five words, uh, who is Ben Haggard, that's what I would have said. Would you agree with that, or am I making it too simple for myself? Uh, yes, I would agree with it, and it's too simple. <laughs> <laughs> I would maybe, just to enrich it very slightly, um, propose that uh, it may be the human role on this planet is to bring consciousness to the process of evolution, that we have work to do as a, a living species within a living matrix called Earth, and that we have been gifted or we have evolved consciousness, and that is a unique um, evolutionary experiment uh, that we need to give back to the planet as our contribution. And so we need to develop our we need to develop our consciousness not only to help ourselves evolve but to be able to participate in the overall process of evolution. This is a very beautiful closing. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it won't be this year, but uh, I'd love to have you back sometime. Uh, maybe we get to talk more about interplay and less about art. Uh, but I hope my viewers enjoyed it nonetheless, because part of these conversations is that they are spontaneous and free. So uh, how do you feel? Is How has this gone for you? Oh, it's it's been a pleasure. Great way to start my day. <laughs> Okay, Ben, let me say quickly bye-bye to my viewers. Just hold on for a moment. Bye-bye, Ben, and thank you very much for having joined me. Thank you. Thank you very much, my viewers, and uh, I hope to you, you will watch us again in three weeks' time. And um, if you would like to subscribe, you know where, and you get also all the information about our topic and about uh, Ben Haggard, and his biography and how you can reach him. Thank you very much.